Hello and welcome to Eastern Roman History. It is often thought that the Middle Ages were devoid of technological progress, and more specifically in the Eastern Roman Empire, superstition and mysticism ruled and was devoid of invention. Though this is true in a good number of cases, superstition is still part of our world today, as is science and progress. Just like today, science and progress were more than alive in the Middle Ages and the Eastern Roman Empire. So I shall cover a number of examples that should give an indication as to why this seemingly backward and stagnant era was the predecessor to the most advanced and forward-thinking society in history. First I shall begin with scientific theory. Aristotle, in his physics, had thought that things that weighed more fell faster, and vice versa. This theory was finally discredited by Galileo. However, Galileo was not the first to question this theory. John Philoponus, a teacher, philosopher, and Christian theologian from Alexandria, thought Aristotle's theory was bunk. In his commentary on Aristotle's physics, he wrote, see Book 5, Chapter 17, page 683, This is a complete error. As we can see through observation, better than through any abstract proof. If you drop two bodies of vastly different weight from the same height, you will see that the difference in the time that it takes for them to fall is not at all proportional to their difference in weight. It is, in fact, a small difference. He wrote this commentary during the reign of Justinian the Great. In addition, John of Damascus, in his exposition of the Orthodox faith, explains in detail how an eclipse occurs, despite the moon being much smaller than the sun. Simeon Seth, in the 11th century, who, in his summary of physics, gave a number of explanations for the Earth being a sphere. One such proof was that some stars in the north cannot be seen in the south, and vice versa. Were the Earth not spherical, all the stars would always be visible, regardless of where you were. The Byzantines also excelled in chronometry. Portable sundials survive, such as this one from Aphrodisias in Asia Minor. It has the ability for the user to adjust the time to work in different latitudes, including Rome, Constantinople, and Bordeaux. Another portable sundial synchronized the time with the day of the week, and the month, and the phases of the moon, as well as latitude realignments. It was about the diameter of a 12-inch ruler and 5 millimeters thick. A more obvious invention was Greek fire by Callinicus of Heliopolis in the 7th century. This could be released from a siphon on ships. They could also be used as a kind of crude grenade to set fire to siege weapons. Michael Italiates mentions such an instance. Emperor Morris, in his Strategicon, mentions the Byzantines using stirrups. This is the first time they are mentioned in Europe, and were likely adopted from the Avars. Not only this, but the Byzantines had some understanding of pneumatics. In the Magnora throne room of the Imperial Palace, mechanical lions, birds, as well as organs were complete with accompanying audio effects powered by a water-based mechanism. These creations were reported by Leoprand of Corombona. It is said that Constantine introduced the organ to Western Europe in 757 as a gift to King Pepin. The Romans were masters of water, Three of Constantinople's aqueducts brought water from the mountains to the city, which are 592 kilometers long. This water was stored on a series of cisterns. The Aisha cistern is so large it is used as a football stadium today. The cistern of Philoxenos, also called the Thousand and One Columns, and the Basilica cistern also survive. The latter was host to a scene from the James Bond film From Russia With Love, and could hold 80,000 cubic meters of water. Locks and keys were used by the Byzantines. They used wooden notebooks with wax pages which could be written on and erased. 
Nicitas Cognatus, in the late 12th century, reported in his history that in 1162, in the reign of Manuel Comnemnus, an Arab resident of Constantinople claimed he would fly on the roof of the Hippodrome. Cognatus describes what happened. He stood at the top of the tower wearing a long, wide, white robe. It was twisted around many widths in a wide circle so that it contained many folds. His plan was to unfurl it like a sail and catch the wind. Every eye was turned on him and the crowd shouted, Jump! Jump! How long will you keep us waiting in suspense? The emperor sent a man to dissuade him, but to no avail. The man tested the wind many times by raising his arms and flapping them like wings. When he judged the moment right, he leapt off the tower like a bird, but dropped to the earth like a dead weight, shattering all the bones in his body and giving up the ghost. A similar event occurred in 1912 when a chap jumped off of the Eiffel Tower with not much better results. Lastly, I will talk of maths and astronomy. The Byzantines use Greek numbers, however, Maximus Planudes in the late 13th to early 14th century, in his The Great Method of Calculation According to the Indians, introduced and explained Indian numbers, often called Arabic numerals, which we commonly use today. He wrote, Given that numbers are infinite, but we cannot have infinite numbers, the more philosophical astronomers invented signs and a method for using them so that they could precisely write numbers they needed in a concise way. There are only nine of these signs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. They also postulated another sign that they call the cipher which according to the Indians means nothing. All nine signs are Indian in origin. The cipher is written as zero. Nikephoros Gregoras, the author of the Roman history, who lived from 1295 to 1361, predicted the time, date, and extent of two lunar eclipses and one solar eclipse in 1329 for 1330. For the details, see his letter 40. In 1324, the same Gregoras, in trying to accurately calculate the date of Easter, inadvertently realised that the Julian calendar, the one used in Europe since its creation by Julius Caesar in the mid-1st century BC, was out by a small fraction of a day. He presented his findings to his peers, but Andronicus II Paleologus despite agreeing with Gregoras that his findings were indeed correct, chose not to adopt the altered calendar. He said that it would create confusion and split the church. This was not an idle concern since the church did split in Russia over the calendar in the years to come. However, Gregoras protested that in two to three years, everyone could be instructed and understand the new system. In 1582, Pope Gregory XIII implemented a new calendar which had the same solution arrived at as Gregoras. We still use this Gregorian calendar today. For the full reference of this incident, see Nikephorus Gregoras's Roman History, Book 8, Chapter 13. Although there are, indeed, many more examples of Byzantine learning, these are a few eclectic examples. I have been your host Daniel Maynard, be sure to subscribe and share this video, and this has been Eastern Roman History.